Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Crawford Family Forum for tonight's program, Dangerous Breed, Dog or Man? And now your host for this evening, KPCC's crime and safety reporter, Erica Aguilar. Good evening, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the fact that there are going to be a cyber audience. We're streaming this program live uh, online, so people will be joining us via uh, Twitter uh, online with comments and stuff. So I may incorporate something like that. Just be mindful that um, we uh, will be on the web. We'll have time for some of your questions at the end of our discussion. I'm going to make sure that we have a little bit of time to, to ask our guest different questions that you might be interested in. Um, Try to hold some of those questions to the end. If there's something uh, pressing, I will try to get through it uh, in the middle. But we're going to hopefully leave a lot of time at the end. We have a lot to cover. Uh, I hope to get through all of it. And um, I hope you guys enjoy our discussion. Uh, I wanted to introduce our guests. Here is Lisa Lange. Lisa Lange is the Senior Vice President for PETA, or the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. Next to her is David Howarth. David Howarth is the president and CEO for the Morris Animal Foundation. They're out of Colorado. And over on the end over here is Brandon Fouché. Brandon Fouché is a dog behaviorist. He is here locally here in uh, Los Angeles. Thanks, guys, for coming. Happy to be here. So we're, we're here to have a really thoughtful discussion about an the animal that we probably love the most, right, are dogs. They fill this empty space uh, in our homes. They, they fill the sound that sometimes is empty, you know, in our homes. Uh, they give us unconditional love when we come home, my dog does. Uh, but, you know, some dogs have their bad days. All dogs sometimes have their bad days. Some of us may have uh, struggled with dogs who have uh, shyness, aggressiveness. Uh, we all know somebody who's been bitten or we've been bitten ourselves. This is something that we hear in the media. We hear stories about these dog bites. We're here to really try to understand better. It's why does this happen? What's really behind this? And hopefully what I hope we all take away from this um, is that we, we can see the different layers in the discussion. We can pull them back. We can try to understand and hopefully just learn something new. We walk away and say, you know what? I didn't know that. Or I understand that now. So hopefully we can get through that. Um, I want to make sure that I say that this isn't a full discussion all about um, one breed or the other. This isn't a discussion or a debate about whose position is better than the others. Um, this is hopefully an understanding and a learning process for all of us here. The reason why we all decided we wanted to have a forum discussion about this is um, some of the events that we've heard in the media, some of the stuff that I've even reported on as a, a public safety reporter here at KPCC. Um, the most recent one that we all know about is the mauling that happened in Antelope Valley a couple months ago. That was in May. A 63-year-old woman who was jogging uh, was attacked. She unfortunately died. Um, there is a court case right now, a criminal case going on. Um, and I'm hoping to see if we can sort of understand why do these things happen? What's behind them? Um, we've mentioned, I, I should mention actually, uh, the Hawthorne dog shooting uh, that happened a few months ago as well. These are all incidents that I think um, spark a lot of questions in our mind, uh, perhaps a lot of emotion, and we're gonna hopefully get through why some of these things happen. Some of the statistics I wanted to talk to you about and open up with, uh, is to talk about how many dogs we have here. There are about, according to the US uh, Humane Society, 78 million dogs. We have 78 million dogs in the United States. Uh, the CDC estimates that there are somewhat 4.5 million bites in the United States. Uh, last year, the National Canine Research Council said that there were 31 dog bite related fatalities. Uh, I did some research and found that there was one in uh, LA County last year, in 2011. So this is something that is, uh, I would say, a narrow topic. Um, we have a ton of dogs. 
there are dog bites uh, that happened, there are fatalities, and it's sort of a narrow topic, but it's one that we uh, sort of are just drawn to. In talking about dog bites, dog bite related fatalities, and how we have dogs in our homes, uh, what, we, what we use them for, um, how we love them, there is this ultimate question about when a dog bite happens, is it the dog that we just don't understand? Is it us that we don't understand? I wanted to open up this question now to you guys. I would start us off here. Um, we hear about these incidents. If you, each of you guys can give me, let's just say two uh, dog breeds or two dog type mixes or two um, types of dogs that, that have maybe been in the media before who have been known to either uh, have been reported on, excuse me, to, to bite somebody or to have hurt somebody in the media that you've heard of. Lisa, can you give me um, maybe two that you've heard of? Sure. I mean, I think we all instantly think of the pit bull, and that was the breed of the dog who killed the woman in Antelope Valley. And then I often think about the San Francisco case with the Presa Canario who killed the woman in her apartment building. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we were talking earlier, and I would say, first and foremost, it always is a people, pr a people problem. Whether it's because people are breeding these animals uh, for the wrong reasons, because they either want a macho status symbol or um, they don't know the tendencies of a certain breed of dog, or, or really, as Peter would say, no one should be breeding dogs, period, as long as we have the overpopulation overpopula crisis that we do. Right. Uh, Dave, Mr. Albert, do you want to give me, give me two types of dogs that you've heard of that um, have known to bite someone? Sure, and this answer actually might sound a little flippant, and I don't mean it that way at all, but the national insurance companies would tell you that the, the, the breeds most likely to bite are Cocker Spaniels and Dachshunds. Now, of course, they don't make the news because they're a lot smaller. And so I, I think that the important thing to remember is that all animals, all dogs can bite. They don't have that many ways to express themselves, and their mouths tend to be the ones that, that they use. So the, in terms of two breed or breed types, That's what I would mean. say they're much more, you're much more likely to be bitten by Cocker Spaniels and Dachshunds. <laughs> How about you, Brandon? <laughs> I'm going to agree with the doctor. That's that's true. It's, I mean, the smaller dogs are the ones that I consider to be the real pit bulls, if you want to say, you know. But um, every dog has had his day. Every breed has been where we are today with the breeds that we're here to talk about. And uh, it's mainly people, education, not understanding what brings out this predatory instinct in our dogs. And... We need to be educated on how we are bringing this type of behavior out in our dog. So some other breeds that I uh, that I hear about, that I read about, I've done a ton of research over the last couple of weeks. Um, the German Shepherd, the Doberman, and you talked about every dog has had its day. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rottweiler, mm -hmm. Rottweiler, I've noticed uh, were implicated in a couple of dog bite related fatalities in the 90s. Yes, Erica. In fact, in the in the late 1800s, it was the bloodhound that was the most demonized breed, um, you know, the lovable, floppy-eared bloodhound, uh, because it was associated with slave tracking. That was what they were originally bred for. So it's, you know, I think, to, to Brandon's point, I think every dog breed will go through a period of demonization, um, you know, perhaps with the exception of the smallest in the teacups, um, although maybe they're demonized for other reasons, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Go I ahead, wanted Dennis. to say also, the reason why I believe that we hear so much about the pit bull is that in the beginning when we had German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Doberman Pinschers, when you bred them, we wanted to breed them with another Rot, with another Dobie, with another German Shepherd because we wanted to maintain that look. But when you look at the pit bull, they look so beautiful when they're mixed with any breed. And that's why people want to breed them so much. What about um, the Labrador? Well, yeah, uh, something that's not talked about often is there was a mauling in France several years ago that resulted in the first full face transplant of a, of a, a woman and made a lot of news. And that was a Labrador, um, Labrador Golden Retriever mix. The, you didn't hear very much about that, obviously, because it's not 
as media worthy as if it had been a more uh, a more muscular bully type breed. But uh, I, I think you're right. I think it's it's uh, it's not only a a, uh, a question of predisposition and capability, but it's also a question of popularity. There are there is unquestionably more pit bull and pit bull type animals in the United States now than there was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Well, I think uh, we've, so we've mentioned Rottweilers, um, we mentioned the pit bull mix type, um, we talked to German Shepherd, Labradors, Dobermans. Uh, what traits do you uh, see that all of these types of dogs share? Well, we've all, don't forget the Chihuahua. Chihuahua, actually, <laughs> I, I, you're right, I didn't, I didn't uh, mention the Chihuahua, or the Poodle, or the Jack Russell, right? right? Because Currently, we hear from so many people who say, I want to adopt an animal from a shelter, which is what we urge everybody to do. And they say, but it's all pit bulls and chihuahuas. So I think we've had an, an influx of those dogs, too. And, and, and from our perspective, what we have is a homeless animal crisis. And because those are the two most popular, uh, if, if that's the word for it, animal to be left at shelters, we kind of have to address that situation as it is now. Well, I want to know, what are, the, what, are the so what are the things that these dogs share? I mean, so we, we all know that they all bite. What is it that makes them bite? It sounds like a really, really um, plain question, okay. but I think it's very complex. I think we have to look at how we as society were taught to raise our dogs uh, when we look at why dogs bite. Uh, I've seen, and I've done my own scientific studies with dogs uh, over the many years and talked with people and I have found that it's how we raise them. For an example, if you play tug of war with your dog, you are teaching them to challenge their leader. And if they can challenge you, then when they see someone that makes them feel insecure, they have no problem biting them. So there are some dogs, though, that are insecure. Sort of. I mean, well, I don't know. You guys answer this question for me. Uh, there are some dogs who are innately shy. Well, you're talking about if the dog is an alpha, beta, subordinate, or runt in the litter. Some dogs can become assertive and dominant, but never aggressive. So when we're talking about a dog that has the ability to have what most people would say an alpha personality, which is a dominant personality, but it doesn't necessarily mean aggressive. It's the strength of personality. So if you've got a dog like that that has the ability to be that way, if you bring that side out of him, then that's what you're gonna get. It's almost like giving a kid a toy gun and everyone plays the part of being shot and then he goes into his father's drawer and brings out a real gun and shoots someone. Now we wanna say guns are bad. So, Eric, if I could, ahead, I, I, I think there's another analogy. Um, and, and all cars drive fast. They can, they have that capability. But there are certainly cars that were built to drive fast and other cars which were built to tow things. Now, you don't really want to tow things with a car that was built to drive fast. You don't really want to drive fast in a car that was built to tow things. But in when you talk about dog breeds and what is the breeds that we're talking about, particularly the ones that people that in incite fear in us, the, those are breeds which are built to have predispositions. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to. Every dog is an individual. Every dog has a multitude of circumstances which lead it to do any single action. However, This is sort of built. why we see the Border Collie herd sheep. Absolutely. Herd me. Herd you. <laughs> like and that. in fact, <laughs> oftentimes nip you in the heel like it was bred to nip, nip cattle in the heel. That's what, that's what we've bred these animals. So behavior is unquestionably genetically, has a genetic base to it, but it doesn't mean that they're predisposed have to do that. I think it's also that people need to be aware. If you get a certain breed of dog, you need to know a little bit about that breed. And I think Brandon can probably speak to this really well, too. What you find with a lot of people is they like a certain breed. They're not exactly sure why they like it. It could be a look. It could match the furniture. It could be whatever it is. <laughs> and then they get the breed, and they start to complain because the terrier digs or because this dog barks or this one's shy. And then I think you'll find when it comes to actually spending time with that dog and teaching them how to be confident, how to know the right thing. I think keeping your dog safe is essential, so teaching them the basic things. But no one's consistent. Most people aren't consistent with their animals. So they come to people like Brandon and other dog trainers and say, can you fix him? Can you just fix him and make him work right? 
and really what you have to do is you have to spend time with your dog. I can't tell you how many people we see who get dogs, never walk them. Think, well, we have a yard, so he gets to sniff out there. It's not, it, and, and that's a huge problem, neglect and not understanding your dog and not spending time with your dog. And, you know, we have to understand that the dogs that we have today are pets. The dogs that we're talking about that had jobs, we don't need those dogs anymore. So we don't need to bring out the predatory side in that dog. But society teaches us to do that through the games. And so if you've got a dog and you say, let's just say a, a, um, a Dutch Shepherd, and you read through the books and you say, well, I see that this dog can do this and this dog can do that, and you start building obstacles in your yard, and making them do all these things, but they really don't have a job. They're pets. And so because they're pets, we don't need to bring out that predatory side in them. We don't need to wake up that hormone that makes them become a predator. Because all excitement is related to the hunt, to the kill. And when you wake that up, then that becomes the most important part in a dog's life. Because you're telling him to think with his mouth. And Go ahead. Yeah, I think that there are three parts to a dog. There is the predatory side, and on the other end of that is the love and affection, positive reinforcement, which is what we do. And then there's that middle section, which I call the superhero part of the dog, that we never tap into because we haven't been taught that. We buy toys, squeaky toys that represent a kill. We give them stuffed animals that look like the little Pomeranian that moved in next door, <laughs> right? And then he grabs them, shakes them, he squeaks, and he kills them. And we say, I'm, he's never done anything like this before. This, this, you said something that really interests me. Um, you said, uh, we bring certain things out of them. Uh, David, I wanted to ask you about uh, sort of this, this, this thing that I've looked at during research is this genotype versus phenotype kind of thing. Can you explain that for us? Probably not very cogently, but I can give it a try. <laughs> Why did you try? Uh, um, so uh, the analogies that I use often are that the genotype I is like the cards that you're dealt, and a phenotype is the way that those cards get played. So except that we're not talking about five-card stud where we can even someone like me can figure out the probabilities of success. We're talking about a million card that get played with multiple interactions between them all. So. I might have been born with the genes to be six foot tw 10. I'm not six foot 10, I'm five foot 10. Now, <laughs> somehow that that was played out as I was growing up, as for whatever bad thoughts I had, I kept, I st I kept myself stunted. But the, the genotype versus phenotype means they have the potential, but it, in the phenotype, it doesn't necessarily have to be expressed. And I think, uh, if I could, I think Lisa, Brandon made terrific points in if we're trying to talk about what do we, why are these dogs biting, I think we oftentimes forget and put our animals into um, sort of untenable situations. Uh, Labradors that aren't allowed to retrieve, it's in their names. Um, you know, they're supposed to retrieve, it's their job. Uh, uh, Sheepdogs or, or herders who aren't allowed to herd, uh, we, or you know, we have Dalmatians who were bred to run alongside carriages. Um, and yet they stay in a small 20 by 30 foot backyard and never are allowed to go out and run. So when you're selecting your animals, it's, it's, it's crucial, I think, to know what were the animals bred for, what was that mix predominantly bred for, and we'll get into that in a second, because <laughs> once you get out of the pure bread, it's extraordinarily difficult to uh, ascertain what breed they really are. But um, uh, we, we don't do our animals a service by not understanding their nature and, and allowing them to express it. Lisa, you're shaking your head. No, no, I'm agreeing. Yeah. I, I don't know why I'm going like <laughs> that. <I'm laughs> you agree? No, it, I do. Uh, uh, your mic. I'm sorry. I do. It's just a matter of, it's, it, it's, there's so much neglect out there. And it starts with not understanding your dog. And, you know, we're very pro-mutt. And... Um, it doesn't matter if you, if you and, and this isn't what David's saying, but it doesn't even matter if you know what the breed is. Every dog needs attention. Every dog needs exercise. It's important to know, if, to understand if they do have some. I mean, I have a Border Collie. She herds the cat. She's not she's a Border Collie mix. I mean, way, way a long time ago, there was a purebred Border Collie in there. And she's lab. 
So she needs a lot of exercise. She wants everybody in the same room. She loves to herd the cats. And we try to play up to the positive sides of that. But, I mean, you know, I can't tell you how we see so many people not taking the time to understand even the basics with their dogs. Brandon? Well, this is what I think the part of the problem is. We believe that exercise is so important. And it's really not. I mean, if we were to take a trip now to the Serengeti. But you're saying exercise is not important. Exercise is not that important. Tell me. But activity is. Activity. Okay. okay. Thanks. But if we were to go to the jungle now, you will not see animals running around the jungle. <laughs> unless they're catching food. Okay? So when we bring out this in our dog, yes, we might have a Labrador retriever or a cattle dog, and that's what they're born to do, but we don't have to feed that thing. There are animals that are born in the wild, and if they're not treated by their parents and their mother to become better hunters, then they're not good at it, and they die. So we don't need to make our dogs good at being predators. Why? Because their food comes in a can. <laughs> it comes in a bag. So when you throw a ball, you wake up that hormone that makes him chase, but that chase is an inanimate object, and so it doesn't fill the cycle of life. It doesn't feed the stomach, so it becomes a neurotic thing. And if it becomes neurotic, then that dog that chases the ball can now chase the skateboard or the bicyclist or ultimately a jogger. I want to I throw in a little bit of a, a question here, which is, so we talked about... Um, Dogs that are that are are known for certain things, right? The, the collie, uh, the retriever. With the pit bull mix, their their ancestry was um, the pit, right? The bull baiting. So, uh, is there any way uh, we can avoid that? Meaning the 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 eight uh, maybe gene that that's in these dogs that are. Um, we're, we're historically made to fight. So, so I think it's, uh, well, the CDC statistics are, I think, interesting. I also think that they're misleading. I, I, I think when you think about animals who are aggressive, who are, have an, aggressive, an aggression problem, people who we would, I would immediately say, you really need to go talk to someone like Brandon, those are, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of the animals that we, that we have. I mean, most the, the vast majority, 99 plus percent of dogs in this country are loving companions throughout almost their entire lives. Do they have the genetics to do those bad things? Of course they do. Um, but as, as you point out, Brandon, the, just because you ch have a dog who loves to chase his ball doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be chasing a jogger. You can stop that behavior and teach them one way is okay, mm -hmm. balls are okay, joggers not so good. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think you can intervene, and whether you're talking about a Labrador chasing a ball or a pit bull who, who has uh, certain tendencies, then you can stop that behavior. And, and as Lisa le led with, I think oftentimes this just comes down to a problem of people not being able to train their animals appropriately. The genetics are there. They're there for every dog. But the behavior can be modified, absolutely. I want to follow up on something you said. You said uh, talked about the CDC st uh, statistics, Center, uh, Centers for Disease Control. Um, I just want to uh, let throw out some of the numbers out here with, to follow up what he said. Um, he, so the CDC did a, a study in 1979, uh, well, over 1979 to 1998, um, and they found a lot of the dog uh, bite-related fatalities uh, had to do with um, mostly pit bull types and Rottweilers. Um, they haven't done a study again, uh, mostly because of this uh, discussion that we're talking about. We really don't, we're not sure about mixed breeds and w whether your border collie is really full bred border collie all the way out or here. Um, but. With Lisa, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That's not a pure bred. <laughs> She's a mutt. She's a mutt. Right? <laughs> well, but, um, we w so we don't, we're not sure, but in the media, we always hear about the pit bull uh, mauling somebody, the Rottweiler. Um, can they be rehabilitated? What do you think, Lisa? 
That is a very tough question. I think you have to look at each dog as an individual and see what their background was to the extent that you know, it, that, you, that you can know it. Um, I think that it is foolish to look at a breed like the pit bull and not recognize the capabilities of that animal hurting other animals and hurting other people. You have to recognize it. And I think that when you tell people you can take any pit bull and you can rehabilitate them with just the right training, you're putting an awful lot of faith in that individual person. And I would say that people can let dogs down all of the time. And it's a risky situation. If you, for example, were to take a former fighting dog and try to rehabilitate, rehabilitate that dog, that is an incredibly risky thing to do based on what we know they physically had the capability to do and what they have been taught to do. Does that go the same for any other um, power breed, the Rottweiler, the German Shepherd? Well, I would say what, what Lisa says is absolutely accurate. It is a, it is a hard, hard thing to do. Um, I think your question was, is it possible? And here's where we get into the difficulty of this conversation, is that it's always probabilistic. You know, whether there are people who you say, you've got a 98% a chance of failing, and you say, so there's a chance I could win. <laughs> it's, it's y the, it, we are talking probabilistically, and yes, for pit bulls, Rottweilers, even though they might have been through horrible situations, are they redeemable? I would say probably yes. But are, is it possible, is it likely, and is it fair to that animal? That's what I think where we get into, into an honest conversation about can that animal, would that animal be, is it rehabilitatable? And I think, there are, I think most professionals in this area have said for some animals it's, it's just really, really hard. Well, well, what does their life look like, too, if I can just say, and then, then but yes. what does their life look like? If you've rehabilitated this animal and rehabilitation for this former, for the sake of just an example, this former fighting dog is life for the rest of their life in a cage. Is that fair to that dog, especially an active dog like a pit bull? We would argue no, it isn't. Brandon? Well, I, I think it's deeper than that. I think we have to look at what type of aggression we're dealing with. We have this tendency to say aggression and it's gonna cover all areas. You've got fear aggression, dominance aggression, subdominant aggression. Some dogs are multi-layered and so when we approach the dog, we have to look at what, what is this? On a scale of one to 10, where does this dog stand? Is he really a three? But how you try to approach that problem made it a 10? If that's the case, then anything over three is a learned behavior. And so if it's a learned behavior, then it can be unlearned. If it's genetic, then we can teach you how to cope with it. Now here's when things get kind of interesting. We usually try to cope with it by training the dog. Training is something that was given to us. We had nothing, we, we had to accept it. But training is actually avoidance work. It's going in the opposite direction. How so? Well, when you tell your dog to sit and stay, you're preventing him from socializing, from going over there. When you tell him to down, we generally say it because we're trying to prevent him from going somewhere. So it's avoidance work. It's the opposite of what we really want. We want to socialize our dog. If we can socialize our dog with rabbits, cats, birds, whatever is in our lifestyle, then we're going to have a dog that's balanced. But when a dog is in a hormonal state that wants to go and investigate something, that's a strong hormone that's in place. And you tell him to do something like sit and stay to prevent him from going there, then you're actually building stress in your dog. And so when you're dealing with aggression, that stress is so strong, it trumps everything. And then when he goes after the cat or whatever he's after, then you're powerless. So we need to be taught how to socialize our dogs. Even with humans, if I wanna meet you, I have to come and socialize with you. Training is going in the opposite direction. I wanna, did you want, yeah. I wanna introduce um, a man that I, uh, did an interview with. Um, his name is uh, John. He's from West Hollywood. And he had a traumatic experience uh, with uh, the neighbor's pit bull and his grandmother. Um, unfortunately, she passed away from a bite. Um, but she ta he talks about um, this sort of fear he sees when uh, he sees a dog. There's a certain look in a dog's eye 
he sort of stops and he's, he's focused and he's zeroed in, almost blank, vacant stare. And I can just, and I can see it, I can sense that there's an energy, and that's more what I'm talking about. So it's not like this dog that's gnarling and like pulling on the chain. He's talking about this stare. He calls it a blank stare. And he says, and he himself has been charged by a Rottweiler. Um, and he says it's a stare, it's a blank stare, it's what he called a trigger. And that is sort of what kept, keeps him away from those types of dogs. Are there certain triggers we should be looking for? Uh, yes, obviously. And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll yield to Brandon to talk about what you should do in the face of, a, of an aggressive dog that's not controlled. I think that's something that's one of those walk-around safety skills that anybody should have is there are a few things that one should do, if nothing else, to not provoke an animal and make sure that you can get yourself or, or your loved one to a safe place. That's, that's a different story, but I think that the stare that he's talking about is um, traditionally dogs give us some warning signs. That's one of the things that they do. They were in a social animal. They have to give each other social communication cues all the time, and, and we would know them if we saw them. The tail is down. The ears are, are back. The hackles are up. There will growl, and it goes through a succession. There are some breeds who, who don't do that and who have been trained, and many of the, the more power breeds, as we call them, ha have that tendency. So that instead of the ears down, hackles up, they will look at you with a, with a dead eye, basically just ranging you. But so th th it, that, is an, that is a real thing, and, does it, and is it scary? Heck, heck, heck yes. When I was in practice, that was a very scary thing to see that. But um, I, I, I don't think that just because it's a Rottweiler, it's going to be able to do that, or just because it's a pit bull, it does that. I've, I've seen that same blank stare coming from, from any breed, you're chihuahuas. Not, you're nodding your head. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's deep because you don't know if you're dealing with a dog that's been shits and trained, and that's a dog that's been professionally bred to go after you then he's looking for certain weaknesses in, your, in, in the person. But most dogs, it starts off with a look. And then from the look, it's a body posture, maybe hair rising. And then there's a growl. And after the growl, there may be a bark. And after the bark, then he'll, he'll attack. But just because a dog is looking at you, he's waiting to see what you're doing. So a lot of that is, is our own fear that we're putting into it. Uh, I, there's another man that I actually wanted to introduce as well. Uh, he's, um, his name's Richard. He's from Echo Park. He owns uh, a pit bull mix type. He adopted him from a shelter. Um, he talks about this look, but it's a different type of look. Go ahead. You know, he, he kind of provides a little bit of protection, especially if she's out walking by herself. People sort of will stay away. And, you know, truth be told, he's a sweetheart. He would never yeah. <laughs> hurt anyone like I just think that you have to be responsible as a dog owner with, with any kind of dog. Them. But any kind of sort of power breed dog, they're a lot like people, like I said, I don't like everybody, and neither does he. <laughs> I think that's true, right? Uh, but, uh, so we're talking about this look, um, and what he means is that, um, so he, he, he has a pit bull mix, and when he walks down the street, people see that look, and they walk the other way. Is, is, is that... Is that, I mean, is that fair? I mean, to, to sort of say, well, that dog has that look and he's likely going to bite me? That's media. <laughs> That's media. Yeah, it, I don't think it's fair. In fact, when I... <laughs> when, I when I see pit bulls or Rottweilers, I usually, um, I usually smile big and go over and, and say hi to them. Maybe that's not what the owners are intending, uh, but I do think this is a good example of someone who, who, who sees the value. I mean, animals, as you said at the very beginning, animals provide us with a tremendous amount of things. They provide us with companionship. They provide us with protection. Historically, I ancient times, they provided us with a, a hunting companion. And, and all of those things are still in the animal. And uh, apparently, I, I think, uh, th your last interview, likes part of that protection thing. And so if he, he, and he probably is giving the dog a lot of nonverbal cues that that's an okay thing. Uh, just when your dog barks at the front door, 
or barks at someone who's walking onto the lawn, well, as they say, sometimes that can drive you crazy until that person who's walking on the lawn means you harm. So that's, I, I think we need to be thoughtful about how do we work with the animal's instincts, with their genetic predispositions, and allow, um, allow the dogs to be dogs in a safe way for society. Uh, that look uh, we talked about, I mean, so he, he uses the dog sort of um, a little bit for protection maybe when his wife's walking around downtown, maybe by herself. Um, uh, can, I, can we say that that's a status symbol? That we um, that media, like you said, or just society has chosen to uh, represent itself as um, this is uh, my dog. It's a pit. It's a rot. It's a German Shepherd. Whatever breed you want it to look like, but it's um, it's big and powerful, and it means something. Yeah, as I said, every dog, every breed's had its day, and this is the pit bull. Lisa, you, you yeah, were going to say, it just kind of all comes down to the person. You know, I think he, he, he the, the person you interviewed may have done this with, uh, with a German Shepherd. I don't, I don't know if he intentionally got a pit bull mix. Um, but it, it really does. I mean, you see someone walking down the street with a pit bull or a pit bull mix who's got the prong collar and he's got the outfit and he's got the whole thing. He is sending you a message. The person is, not the dog. Dog's just taking a walk. You know, the person, but the person's sending a message, and those are the people you got to be a little bit more wary of. Which brings us to our main question, right? Which is, is this a dog? Is it man? Who is sort of responsible for the behavior of the dog whenever it becomes a really bad, unfortunate situation? Eric, I think you'll find consensus up here on that. Yeah, one. I think mm -hmm. so too. But, you know, I, the reason I, I bring this up is because, um, again, you know, we recently in the media we've we've heard of dog attacks. Um, we talked about uh, the Little Rock situation. Um, he's facing a second degree murder charge uh, for the fatal mauling of the 63 year old uh, woman who who is who was drugging. I, I guess it, it it leads me to decide um, or to to ask who is legally responsible, who should be responsible uh, when your dog, no matter uh, the breed, um, goes in and injures somebody, either seriously or, or minor even injury. You mentioned some insurance liabilities. In California, um, a, home in a homeowner can be denied insurance um, or your insurance could go up. Um, last uh, year, I believe, in well, actually, excuse me, 2011, there were about um, 9.2 or 92.7 million dollar payouts because of of dog bites here in California. Um, under California law, the owner of the dog who I I is always liable for any damages that ha was suffered by a person, um, was bitten by somebody, uh, either in the public place or um, lawfully in your private place. Mm -hmm. I think these sort of uh, these sort of situations that we find ourselves in uh, lead to obviously this this question of who's responsible, but it also starts leading us into this whole idea: is do we introduce legislation? Do we introduce laws that try to uh, keep us as in humans safe? Maybe dogs as in uh, dog safe. Uh, Lisa, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, talk a little bit about. PETA's position on uh, breed-specific legislation. Um, I think a lot of people might want to try to understand where uh, PETA is coming from on their positions with breed-specific legislation. Sure. We're in favor of breed-specific legislation. We're in favor of any legislation that bans the breeding of any dog, though. So we to follow that through, as long as there's an overpopulation crisis like the one we're facing now, uh, we want to see an end to all breeding. And to follow that through further, that means mandatory spay-neuter laws. That means a ban on breeding, and that's intentional breeding for backyard breeders and people who are careless and just allow their animals to breed and sell the puppies or just try to find good homes. Um, we are also in favor of breed-specific legislation that does require, because some of the breed-specific legislation isn't about banning the breed, the uh, the breeding of a certain breed. It's also about mandatory spay neuter for certain breeds of dogs, um, 
and we are in favor of that. We're in favor of anything that reduces the number of homeless animals. Uh, thanks for, for, for differentiating the fact that there are breed-specific legislation, and there are different types of uh, legislation that says, like you said, mandatory uh, spay and neuter. There's also um, banning a breed altogether. Uh, there's also uh, dangerous dog laws which says that if uh, a dog is uh, deemed dangerous, you know, there's sort of a process that goes through. Uh, you know, um, I've got to ask a question out in the audience. Um, do we have, um, do we have Marsha Mead? Yeah, we do. We do have Marsha over here. Hi, uh, Marsha, can you stand up real quick? She is the, um, <laughs> hi, thanks hi. for coming. You're welcome. <laughs> She's the uh, executive director for LA County's uh, Animal uh, Care and Control Center, is that right? Right, for the County of Los Angeles. Talk to me a little bit, if you can. Um, tell me, uh, what is LA County's dangerous dog uh, law? Just give us a brief, if you could, uh, overview of, of, how, of how those logs work in uh, LA. Well, the County of Los Angeles's ordinance is a very strong ordinance. The Board of Supervisors takes public safety very seriously and they wanna make sure everybody is safe, people and animals, because animals are often the victims as well. Of course, it's not breed specific. That's not legal in California. Right. Um, and we have two categories of dogs, um, of, of designations. One is potentially dangerous and the other is vicious. So to be vicious, you have to have done um, a, a severe injury. Uh, a potentially dangerous dog is any dog that has caused a person to have to take a defensive action within the prior 36 months when the person, when the dog is off its property. So if it's out chasing people and you have to jump into the bed of a pickup truck or jump over a fence or do something to protect yourself, twice in 36 months that dog could be declared potentially dangerous. Also if it's um, bitten a person unprovoked um, and caused not a severe injury, but still caused an injury. Um, and, and third is if it's killed a domestic animal when off its property. Awesome. A uh, vicious dog could be a dog that's been found to be trained and bred for fighting. Okay. Um, a dog that's already been declared potentially dangerous and continues to violate, well, its owner allows it to continue to violate the ordinance, um, or a dog that's caused a severe injury to a human. And that's muscle tears, fractures, disfiguration, and so forth. So the, um, what happens is, is we have um, a team of officers and these officers handle these cases for us and they do a full investigation. If they feel that it meets a, one of those designations, they'll file a petition for a hearing officer to determine whether the animal should be so designated. Um, if it is designated, there are a series of restrictions that are placed on the dog the keeping of the dog. This is separate from any criminal charges that might be filed against the owner. This is just for the animal control uh, sort of the department? For that, yeah, for right. that, and for the, the keeping of that dog. So a potentially dangerous dog, uh, it has to be kept in a locked, secure yard. It can't be off its property unless it's on a secure leash, walked by a competent adult. It has to be muzzled in public. Of, sure. of course, has to be spayed and neutered and microchipped. Um, they may be required to get insurance and so forth. Uh, thank you. I'm um, sorry. I didn't mean to, to surprise you, but thank you so much for, for uh, explaining L.A. County's uh, dangerous dog laws. And I, I, I wanted to give you guys all a summary of, of, of what they are because ultimately we, we you know, as uh, audience members, um, as people who live in L.A. County, as people who live in California, um, we want to decide, you know, whether or d d to discuss, do some of these laws are effective? Do they work this way? Um, Marcia, you had something else you wanted to say. I just wanted to mention we do have a mandatory spay-neuter ordinance for all dogs in um, Los Angeles County. It's not by breed. Got it. Okay, David. So, um, <laughs> I, I, there are 300 communities around the United States who have dog restrictions, breed-specific restrictions, and I um, and uh, all in many European countries. I would tell you that. Statistically, those don't seem to be very effective. Uh, for Lisa's point, for Lisa's point, I, they may be very effective in reducing unwanted dog populations, and I think that that's a, that's a laudable goal. But in terms of effectiveness for stopping attacks on people, it shifts. So they stop being pit bull attacks on people and start being Rottweiler attacks or other breed attacks. They still happen. Uh, Denver, where I live, has had a pit bull ban since 1989. There's been numerous studies. We have multiple breeds that are still associated with dog fights. Um, 
what is effective are the common sense legislations, the ones that we've simply described. If an animal has shown itself to be unstable and aggressive, then they need to be, their steps need to be taken to protect the community and people. And I think that's something that I, I, I think many people, uh, including most professional organizations, so the American Veterinary Medical Association, the An American Animal Hospital Association, the CDC itself, the uh, uh, American Association of Animal Control Officers, all have come out with policy statements saying breed-specific bans don't, don't work. Don't work with regard to <laughs> reducing violence. We're with sorry. reducing <laughs> violence against animals, yes. For, for reducing populations, they're effective. But again, you know, I, I, I think as I heard, Julissa, if it was a ban against poodles, you'd P Peter would be in support of that too. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're, we want to ban on breeding. As long as there are as many homeless animals as there are in shelters across the country, we don't think we should be breeding one more dog or cat. Is that realistic? Yes, you it's think very so? realistic. You, you think that it we is. can completely ban all dog breeding um, um, and, and really get down the overpopulation? We can and we should. PETA for years has been writing to every mayor in the country, every governor of every state in this country saying, do your part. We can't, people, I'm sure most people in this room are doing their part by adopting dogs and cats and bringing them into their homes, but we're swimming upstream. We spay and neuter about 10,000 animals on our clinic in southern Virginia. We do pit bulls for free. We've done more than 400 already this year, pit bulls and feral cats. We cannot catch up with the stream of animals coming into shelters and, and animals being bred in people's backyards and in puppy mills. So. But it's doable. It's completely doable. And it's better for the city. It's better economically for every city. And, you know, so here's my plea to any mayor or anybody else out there listening to this. We've got to get this done like we've done in Los Angeles. Brandon, I want to give you a chance to weigh in. You, you look like you were interested no, in I, commenting. I agree. I mean, we need to stop breeding. I mean, there's many dogs that here that can be uh, adopted and taken home. And I think we should take advantage of that and, uh, and stop breeding. I, I think that's... How do you think? Wh I mean, what are your thoughts on the on the on on breed specific legislation? We just heard about um, LA County's dangerous dog laws and how they work. Well, look, uh, banning breeds, no, a specific breed, no. I think that, uh, as I said before, every dog has had his day. I think it's responsibility of people. We need education to teach them uh, how to handle dogs. I don't think that we uh, really have been taught. I mean, in the beginning, I have a, uh, someone that I knew that used to work with wild animals. And they told me that in the beginning, when they could not uh, tame an animal, they trained them. And so we got elephants sitting on balls and uh, lions sitting on boxes. And now that we have a domesticated dog that is tame, we're still training. So we're really not bringing out the, uh, what I call the superhero of the dog. And so we're stuck with the, uh, the prey drive. And I think that's what's creating a lot of our problems. We don't know how to really reach the essence of that dog. So, so Eric, I guess I, I do have to go on, on, on record saying that I'm, I'm not averse. Uh, I or my organization doesn't have a stand against breeding. Right. Um, but uh, one of the big problems with breed-specific legislation is that it's extraordinarily hard to identify a breed. Um, it, 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 it phenotypically, we go back to genotype and phenotype, once you have a mixed breed, it is very clear, we went one generation away, it is extremely difficult to determine whether that is a pit bull mix, a Labrador mix, or a boxer mix. And normally that would be somewhat inconsequential because genetic testing for your breeds tends to be more of a cocktail party. Wow, you know, she's, I know it's 90 pounds, but it's half chihuahua. <laughs> um, so said the test. But when we talk about breed-specific regulations and uh, insurance costs, uh, communities that will not allow, in some cases you've seen euthanasias, of animals who are being told, being, s being labeled as a certain type of breed. And, th and that, I think, is when we've, we've run out of science and instead we're letting emotions determine because it looks like a pit bull, it looks big and scary, it's got you know, black fur, I don't, uh, it, it must be a pit bull, therefore it must be bad. And, that, and I think that is as bad as saying 
uh, males under the age of 21 tend to have higher accident rates in cars than, than, than other populations, and therefore we should never allow males under 21 to drive cars. It doesn't make sense. Lisa, go ahead. <laughs> we, I'm sitting here thinking of which direction to go in on this one, but um, I think, you know, from our perspective, we have cruelty case workers in the field, and I'd say the vast majority of cases that we're working on are abused and neglected pit bulls. And I think that animal control officers around the country will testify to the same thing. That's why you see anywhere from 30% to 70% when it comes to Detroit shelters filled with pit bulls. Um, I think a large reason for that is because the dog is bred for certain breed-specific characteristics. Um, people do like the macho status symbol. There are a lot of wonderful people out there who are adopting pit bull mixes and pit bulls for all the right reasons, but they are outnumbered by the people who are adopting them for all the wrong reasons, or more, more to the point, they're not adopting them, they're breeding them. And realistically, we have to do something to address the pit bull overpopulation crisis, and it is true. It could be the Rottweiler, it has been the Rottweiler, it could be the German Shepherd, it could be the pit bull, which it is now, followed quickly by the Chihuahua, but in every situation, we would say, you have to address that situation, and you have to bring those numbers down. They're sitting in shelters all over this country. And another, in, in another thing I would suggest on breed-specific legislation is that I think we have to have mandatory home checks for any pit bull that's adopted out of a shelter. You have to go into that home and make sure that dog is not going to live in a chain, is not going to live in a crate all day long, is not going to be trained to the extent that you can check those things, is not going to be trained in aggressive ways to make the dog more aggressive. Without doing that, I mean, casting a dog out to a home to say, well, we've adopted out one pit bull, but not knowing what that home is like or how that animal is going to be li living is extremely irresponsible. And when it comes to a dog who may have been bred to be aggressive or taught to be aggressive, it can also be dangerous. You, you said um, uh, going out door to door and making sure that, you know, uh, if you do have a pit bull, it's not on a chain or, you know, enforcing laws, basically. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's adoption standards. We need adoption standards. We need adoption regulations for every dog that leaves a shelter, for every cat that leaves a shelter. And some shelters are doing it. They're doing home checks um, before adopting animals out. And I think that it's especially important to do when you look at animals who are, who are abused more than others, like, like the pit bull. Uh, um, uh, the reason I bring up enforcement is, is I just think that um, right now, especially with our uh, um, economy, Sometimes municipalities don't have the money to go out and enforce some of these laws. Uh, David? Well, absolutely. You, you talk about resources. Now, you, I think the questions are, what should we do? And then there's the next question, which fo immediately follows on. Once you've established what you should do, then you need to ask, what can you do? And, and, and may, there may be a difference there. However, I think what Lisa's describing is animals' roles in our society are different now than they were 15 years ago. Um, you know, as we've seen since World War II, uh, dogs have come uh, from the street to the backyard, from the backyard to the kitchen, from the kitchen to the family room, and now to the bedroom. And, and you know, there's a statistic which I love, which is 82% of dog owners, as surveyed by the American Pet Products Association, uh, will, in back when we had home, um, home phone message machines, would actually sing happy birthday to their dogs on, on the <laughs> phone. <laughs> I've okay. done that. <laughs> That's and we would have, right? I, I think, and it's no longer something to be ashamed of when you have dog pictures of your kids and your dog at, at, at work with you. My point being, resource spending by our communities has not gone up concurrently with that rise within the human-animal interaction and the human-animal bond that we have. And, th and there's a disconnect there. And so we, um, I you know, people will be very upset about having to spend $150 at the veterinarian, but at the same, by the same token, they will say, I will do anything at all for this animal because this animal gives me some s such love. Well, you know, I, I also, I want to say, I think that the rescue organizations are doing that. They are. They're going to homes, they're checking them, they're making sure that that dog can't get out, he's not tied up, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of that, uh, I'm sure they would be willing to, uh, to be a part of that. In terms of resources. Yeah, a lot of them are. I'm saying it should be mandatory. <coughs> and I think when it comes to um, the economics of it, look at Pasadena. They're going to start enforcing the registration law. They are going door to door soon, starting in September. September. 
and they're going to be checking to make sure that every dog in a home is registered. And what that means is they're going to be raising revenue. If, if you find that you don't have a registration, they're going to give you a chance to register your dog. And from that money, they'll be able to raise money for the shelter. It's the same thing with mandatory spay-neuter laws. If we check and make sure that these animals are, are, are spayed or neutered, or more than that, we're all for major licensing differentials. If you don't spay or neuter your animal, you should pay $500 or more for your license because you're part of the problem. If you... If you've spayed or neutered your animal. What about low income families? She's saying, what about low income families? There are low cost spay neuter programs all over the city, and they can get their animals. Yeah, you, we're, we're almost there, um, about 8 o'clock, <laughs> 8 01. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, one last sort of roundup question, and then we're going to get to lots of questions. Hopefully, we'll get to your comments and questions there. Obviously, we've talked all about genes, we talked about the laws, we talked about legalities, insurance claims, um, how to train and um, uh, learned behavior. Um, what is the one thing that we can do uh, to sort of be able to live with our dogs, um, keep ourselves happy, that's what we have our dogs for, uh, but also keep them safe? Wow. <laughs> I know, it's super broad. Yeah. You can go um, wear it. I read this book several years ago when I got my dog, and um, it's called If Bones Would Rain from the Sky, and it's by Suzanne Clothier. And what she talks about is we spend a lifetime trying to make dogs exactly the way we want them to be. We want them to behave a certain way. We want them to be whatever it is we want them to be, and we don't spend enough time understanding who they are. Um, and that book meant a lot to me, and I, I hope I have applied it to my dog. Understanding your dog, understanding their needs, um, I think is is really key, and you know, spending time with them, giving them. I'm lucky; I get to take my dog to work every day, um, but I also sing to her, which is probably not the best thing in the whole world, <laughs> considering I have the worst voice in the world. But you know, spending time with your animals and knowing who they are, keeping them safe. For me, that has meant um, training her cer in certain ways. She's an incredibly smart animal, but if I don't teach her to stop and sit, she will run straight into the street. So. I think that there are certain basic things you can teach your dog to keep them safe. And keep others safe. And keep others safe as well. So um, it's just a matter of really spending time with your animal, knowing who they are, and just just, just loving them to death. David? Well, I, I actually I can't add very much to what Lisa said. I think you know, I have a, I have a four-month-old puppy at the moment, and uh, what we have, we have found is that the more time – that you can spend with an animal, particularly during growing and socialization windows of its life, the better that animal will always be to you. You know, you, we can say what we would about young males and their dogs, but uh, I used to work construction back before I went to vet veterinary school, and um, those dogs that were with their owners every day, at the job site, well taken care of, always protected, those were the best dogs. Those were the dogs you always wanted to have around you. Um, the dog where we find the opposite, and I think that's the, the opposite side of that coin, are the, the people who get into having a dog without really understanding the responsibility that it brings with them. Uh, I, I'm often amazed that people will enter into a sometimes 15-year relationship with another living thing, uh, having put less research time into it as they would their next car, which they flip every two to three years. It's, it's incredibly important to understand the animal, that specific animal's needs, that specific animal's tendencies, and then to spend the time that it takes to make sure that that animal understands what's okay and what's not okay in your life. And, uh, and, and the consistency of it is just like parenthood. Brandon. I think that we should learn what our dogs need, what their needs are, as opposed to giving them what we think they want. Because what I have found is when we try to give a dog what we think they want, we make a neurotic dog. And so even though we may be spending time with our dogs, what is the life lesson that we're teaching our dogs? As I said in the beginning, we mainly have been taught to teach our dogs to bring out that predatory side of them. And then on the opposite end of that, we practice a lot of positive reinforcement which is talking to them, playing with them. And that middle side, some people stumble upon that. That's that dog that we find can tell if we're having seizures or heart attacks. That's that dog that can 
help us in finding things. That dog that we teach to find uh, bed bugs and dr drugs and all of those things that really help us as a society. Because without dogs, we couldn't be where we are today as humans if we didn't bring that dog out of the wolf. So I think as humans, we need to be taught what did Mother Nature expect for dogs and how to process information and to talk with our dogs in that way and to stop bringing out these neurotic behaviors. Love and affection can create aggression in our dogs because it creates stress and stress leads to aggression. All right. All right. Um, Erica, I, I, I made a promise to someone there. Could I ask one question of Brandon? Sure. Um, Bra uh, Brandon, so since we have the audience, do, could you give me five things to do or not do if I'm approached by an aggressive dog off lead uh, without control? Just okay. Very good question. Well, uh, first of all, you know, most dogs belong to someone. And if it's a dog that's living in the street, it has access to come in and out of the yard, then they know when you raise your voice and say, go home, get out of here. And so you can just pick up a stick or something and do that, and they understand what that means, and they'll take off. You're not, you're not uh, sort of triggering it? No, not at all. Uh, we have to understand that you know, dogs live with us, and we teach them things without even knowing. It's not training. It's just life lessons, behaviors. And I have found that dogs that live in the street, they see their life, their world, as a predator. Our dogs that live inside the house that don't get a chance to roam, they see the environment as prey. And that's why you can be out walking your dog, doesn't matter how many, and the dog that lives in the street, chances are he will never come up to you because he sees his life as a predator. They stay away. So those kinds of dogs, you really just have to make yourself big and uh, you can fend them off. But if it's a dog that's been shits in trained, a dog that has been taught how to bite people or to be assertive with people, a dog that has been played tug of war with, and mostly everyone that I speak with who has a dog that plays tug of war has and will bite someone. So uh, when you got a dog like Other that, tips, it's right. you, you better run. Uh, other tips run? to keep. <laughs> did, you, did you say run? You better run. Uh. <laughs> and you know, and there's no such thing as, um, I mean, you know, professionally, if you can keep your eye on that dog and back away, that's fine. Okay, that, that'll work. Or you can not look at the dog directly. If he's coming and stopping, coming in stomach, if you keep your eye on him and back away, you can get away. But if this is a dog that's just barking and you act like he's not really there, you're not feeding that energy. And chances are you can just walk away. Okay, so I was trained when, um, that standing still, not making eye contact, staring a few inches over the, over the dog's head, backing away, getting something between you and the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would sound like a good... Good, yeah, that's part of running away. Sense. That's part I of ru run, <laughs> that's running. That's part of running. <laughs> running. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that, look, if you've got a dog that's been trained, shits and trained, then he's going to make you move. He's going to push you. Um, we should uh, now turn to, to questions, comments. It's about a little after 8, and I wanted to make sure we give uh, you guys in the audience a chance to ask our panel members. Um, anything that you guys wanted or, or comment on anything that we talked about today, uh, raise your hand and I think people are like, wow, we've got lots of talkers. Um, we have mics on the side and uh, we'll start over here in the back. Uh, tell, me just, uh, tell me your name and uh, give us a, your question or comment. Hi, my name's Aaron. I have a question for Hi. Mr. Fauché. Is that how you pronounce your name? Fauché. Okay. And um, my question is, what kind of play is okay with my dog? I have a two-year-old uh, pit mix that I got from the shelter. You know, we say play, P-L-A-Y. That's a human term. When we see two dogs playing, they're really trying to determine who is more dominant than the other without actually fighting. But if you play chase or roughhouse with your dog, you must understand it from the dog's perspective. You're the dog's leader. And if you are asking your dog to challenge you by playing rough, then you're telling the dog to climb. 
So what kinds of things should he do then? Well, I think that mental energy is more draining than physical energy. So if you can work with the dog's nose, teach him to find things, then that's going to be better for you. So like well, literally hide like a treat and oh, then absolutely. have him... Okay. Have him find it. And then you can take that treat and put it in a pouch that your keys are attached to and teach him to find that same treat. And then sometimes you can go out to a park somewhere and put your wallet or your keys out somewhere <laughs> and say search and you'll find it. We have another question on this side here. Uh, my name is Pamela Henderson and mm -hmm. I just had a, a concern, particularly uh, for Lisa and the breed specific legislation. Sounds like PETA is for that, not not the side where you know they should be spayed or neutered that's you know, and, and cease breeding, definitely for that. But in terms of legally prohibiting certain breeds in certain localities, to me it seems like that's synonymous with discrimination. Just like we wouldn't say, you know, all African Americans should be in jail, all Hispanics should be sent back to Mexico. I mean, that's, that's pretty much the same effect of doing that. And David already talked about the fact that that's really not effective. Why does PETA take that position when Thank it seems to be so discriminatory? Lisa? Yeah, no, I don't think that is the position that we take. And I, in speaking to Denver as well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in a lot of breed-specific cities um, where there's breed-specific legislation, they grandfather in existing pit bulls. Animals who are in good homes stay in good homes. No one, well, at least we're not, there may be people out there, advocates going in and ripping pit bulls out of good homes. Absolutely not. So that's not part at all of what PETA believes. You have a question there. Yeah, I just wanted to follow hold, hold I think they, uh, everybody else would want to probably hear your question. Hold on just a second. No problem. I just wanted to follow up on that. What Lisa just said is completely untrue. Um, either she doesn't know or she's <laughs> lying. Because PETA's official stance is that all pit bulls are to be destroyed. Any pit bull that comes into the shelter is to be destroyed. Do you want to know yeah. what PETA's stance is on this? For oh, from right someone, from right someone. San Francisco Gate, 2005. From, from your founder. San Francisco Gate. From your founder. Yeah. Well, from someone who's worked at PETA for 20 years. Oh, I will. I'll let everybody know exactly. We're going to let her ta uh, tell her position. That was. Go ahead. Okay. Our stance on pit bulls is that there should be a bre a ban on breeding them everywhere. We don't need. There is not one good reason to breed one more pit bull. Well, we have anywhere from 30 to 70 percent uh, of shelters, I'm sorry, all of shelters have 30 to 70 percent of their dogs right now are pit bulls. That is a current problem. There is no excuse for breeding more. They are the most abused dog in dogdom. We see it in the field every single day, as do cruelty officers all over this country. We want to ban on that breed until we can bring the numbers down, and every pit bull, every pit bull mix, every chihuahua, every border collie, every border collie mix is in a good home, and not just any home. That home has to be good. That means that dog doesn't live on a chain. Gotcha. And if we have to, we want a ban on breeding pit bulls, and we want a ban on breeding all dogs. And what's more is we support breed-specific legislation that mandates spaying and neutering. That is PETA's stance uh, hold on, on pit bulls. Please. We'll have time to, to get to that and have individual conversations. I seriously want to get to a lot of hands here because they had raised their hands, and I think we have a lot of co questions and comments. Um, next, Jenny had one. Okay, go ahead. My name is Gus Sabolino, and I have a question about aggression. Okay. Uh, it's specifically about um, displaced aggression. I have a German Shepherd that I walk every day, and whenever he sees a bicycle, he wants to attack that person that's on that bicycle. And if he cannot get to that person, he'll turn on me. So How basically, do you stop it? So your question is, what is going on within your German Shepherd dog uh, yeah, that's making him display it? this kind of aggression? Yes. OK, can, you, uh, could, what, can one of you guys try to do that briefly? Well, I, I mean, there's a lot to that. I mean, uh, how long have you had the dog, and what kind of games do you play with your dog? I have to ask that in order to, because if I tell you what to do, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a cut that needs a stitch. We need to find out where the problem came from. Maybe you guys can meet together yeah, afterward. <laughs> I think Brandon is going to have a lot of questions. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry? My name is Marla Tauscher. I'm nice an animal attorney. 
I wanted to uh, address the issue, it's more of a comment about um, the dangerous dog laws that we have. I think they're addressing, they are targeting the wrong end of the leash. Um, they're really Go designed, ahead, they're designed to penalize and to kill dogs. When the real problem is the humans, what we really need at the state level is we need dangerous human laws. We need laws that address the issues like recidivist irresponsible dog owners like the situation in Lancaster and other situations, when you look back at these so-called pit bull attacks, what you notice almost all the time and what I see all the time is a complete lack of enforcement by animal control. Um, and I see situations in my practice very commonly where animals are allowed to, or humans are allowed to continuously let their dogs out and when you look back, you realize and you talk to neighbors, it turns out these, pro these dogs have been let out, they've been running the streets for a long time, and the, uh, the owners have not been penalized. And when they talk about this being a lack of resources, it's not. It's a revenue generator. So we're looking for uh, some type of law that would say, hey, if, you're, um, if we have identified that you don't take care of your animal correctly, you should be pen penalized. Well, for example, if you, if, you are allowed to, if you allow your dog to run the streets, if you allow them to get out, you know, say, two times or three times, then you're just not allowed to have a dog anymore. So then I, I, I mean think you would be able, I think you would answer the question, is it dog or man? Your answer would be, it's, it's man. It's definitely the human. Okay. It's definitely. I see it all the time. Um, next question. Uh, uh, we've got a few more minutes. Let's try to squeeze some more in. Um, go ahead. Lisa, this question is directed to you. Do you What's have your any name? My name is Claudia. Nice to meet you. And I'm a volunteer at North Central Animal Shelter, and I've been rescuing dogs and feeding dogs on the street for 20 years. Um, my question to you is, do you have an example of a city that has been successful in forcing spay and neuter laws and the ban of specific breed of, of backyard breeding or any sort of breeding. Is there one city that you can give as an ex as an example that it's successful? Well, again, we're looking at this from the perspective of bringing down numbers of the animals. Not I, I, I'm not even aware of. David says it hasn't helped with bites, but when it comes to I know there is a statistic that when San Francisco passed a spay neuter ordinance specifically aimed at pit bulls, they said that there was a decrease by 24% of euthanasias of pit bulls within just 18 months. You're going to see an immediate decrease in the number of animals going into shelters and the number of animals being euthanized if you, if you require spaying and neutering and if you enforce it. David, did you have anything to add to that? I just want to check. Nope. Okay. Um, next question. Over here. Uh, thank you for a tremendous conversation. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to address this young lady who talked about unaffordability of spay and neutering. It's Give absolutely me your name. oh, Peter. Nice to meet it's you. It's absolutely Peter. essential. If my understanding is, if you have one pair of cats who is not spayed or neutered, and they have an average lifespan of six years, that that pair will be responsible for 420,000 cats. <laughs> anyway, my question. Um, I've had golden retrievers in labs, and they're trained off le to be off leash. Um, they run three to five miles a day, and we're responsible for the Alice's dog park. And the lack of um, seriousness, the education, as you said, training the, the the human. We have Rule 11 over there. If there's a single act of aggression, your dog has to be removed, and it can't come back. And I have yet to have anybody. Even the owners of the dogs who were attacked back me up and tell these people to leave. So, so um, I'm sorry, um, your question. So my question is um, two things. One, it's become a, a real serious question, uh, issue of violence on my street. We ha have recently had a dog who's actually a licensed wolf move in. And my question is twofold. One, could you do more about explaining to us if if we're in a situation where we're actually being attacked, and the idea of running, by the way, I don't think that's necessarily a great idea. Um, <laughs> I've had situations where I've had to defend so my dog with a shovel. So when you're being attacked. Yeah, what do you actually do? How do you, you actually, actually physically do? save yourself? Okay. okay, that's question number one. Question number two is, um, could you go into more detail about how do we find the hero? I think this conversation is incomplete. Okay. How do we find the hero on our dog? And how do you reduce the stressors? Something uh, practical that we can actually use. Let's try to answer that question. Um, so uh, give us uh, at least one really awesome tip <laughs> it, while we're being attacked. Um, 
<laughs> what do we do? You know, and then two, you know, the stressors. This is interesting. You know, it's just like people ask me, well, how do you break up a dog fight? Right. I mean, any way you can. Okay. But doesn't that put and you at danger, though? In danger? I'm sorry. Doesn't that put you also in danger? No, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be there to try to stop that dog fight, you're gonna try to do whatever you can to stop that dog fight. I mean, whatever that is. I mean, you mentioned hitting your dog with a shovel or something. You know, I mean, when you're in that kind of stressful situation, you're gonna do whatever it takes. Okay. So when I said run, I mean, look, if you've got an opportunity to get away and you're being attacked, you better run. Jump on a car or something to get away. Um, but uh, I mean, the don't they say like you're supposed to cover yourself? Yeah. No, I mean, your look, if, because it, that's it, what it you all want depends. To. There's so much involved. It depends on the dog that's coming after you. If it's a dog that's been trained to come after you, you're pretty much got. Okay. So but if it's a dog that's just running the street and you're passing by his territory, you can pretty much scream at him. He's going to run back into the yard. So it just really depends. Uh, the best thing I could say is when you're out walking in areas where dogs are off leash, carry something with you. Oh, you need to carry something with you. I, you need to carry something to raise it up and be big, and that usually works. Um, David, you wanted to say something really quickly? I do. Uh, okay. I think that there are some principles there. One is if, it, if an animal is attacking or is showing you aggression, Stand still, don't make eye contact, have something with you. If you know that there's a threat, bring something with you, whether it's just a walking stick or anything else. And secondly, get something between you and the animal. It can be pretty minor. It can be a piece of cardboard, really, but that re remember, dogs only have a few, a few weapons. And then lastly, as you point out, Erica, if, if worse comes to worse, if you're in the ground, then cover up. Put your arms around your neck, cover over your stomach. Brandon, and hope you get somebody around. Can I ask you to do so uh, in, in maybe one or two sentences? Um, answer the hero question real quick. You know, um, <coughs> dogs to me are like superheroes. And what I mean by that is they have abilities that we wish we could have. They can smell body parts underwater. They can track you for miles. They can tell if people are having seizures, uh, ground zero. That's the beauty in that dog. If we ask them to find bed bugs, they know they're there. But they say, oh, I didn't know you wanted me to find that. <laughs> we do that with the drug sniffing dogs, right? We've got dogs that can find their way home in blizzards without being able to see. This is the part that I'm talking about. And sometimes we stumble on that, but we, we can't see it because we're trying to train our dogs. We're trying to, to get them to do something that they already know how to do. I never met a dog that didn't know how to sit. All right. Okay. Or lie down or follow me. I'm going to go to one more question. Go ahead. Hi. My name is Randy Levine. Um, I just want to address something with you, Lisa. I actually have the statistics from the San Francisco Animal Control. And intake numbers for 24 months prior to the enactment of the breed-specific mandatory spay-neuter, pit and pit mixes intake was 1,238, non-pits 3,312. After 12 months after the breed-specific mandatory spay lauder, pit bulls went up to 1,565, and non-pits went up to 3,565. Uh, 3, um, my comment is, though, is that breed-specific legislation doesn't solve the do dangerous dog issue. What does is enforcing the laws and imposing big fines, um, enforcing leash laws, anti-tethering laws, anti-dog fighting laws, li licensing, spay and neuter. Animals, people who abuse animals, and if you ban a breed, they're still going to be animal abusers. And any, any person that trains their dog to be aggressive isn't going to stop being a tra tra to train another breed not to be aggressive. So right. it's definitely the people and not Thank you. the um, dog. Really quick though, comment to Erica. Sure. Um, you had asked a question about rehabilitating these dogs that come from dog fighting rings. I just want to hand it over to uh, Best Friends and Bad Rap for rehabilitating all the Vic dogs. <laughs> and one, one last thing, for the lady who is um, saying that it was, you know, and I do agree with her, sometimes it's really hard to find a vet that'll spay and neuter your dog. Karma Rescue will spay and neuter your dog for free. All right, all right. Um,
Thank you for all your comments. And thanks, for guys, for coming with me. Um, let me ask, do we have time for, oh, we do, we do, one or two, it's 8.20. Um, if you guys don't mind hanging out with us a little more, nah. All right, so let's just do one more um, over here in the center. Thank you so much. Tell us your name and your Hi, question. My name is Cheryl, and this is more of a comment. First okay. of all, I'd like to thank all of the panel. Actually, I did research all of you, and I did educate myself to this evening. So being a responsible dog owner, I'd like to say thank you. As far as David is concerned, yes, I have an English Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> By the Discovery Channel, lovely. it is the dog that bites the most. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for doing all that research. Uh, one more. Um, um, one more in the back, is it over here? Um, my name is Mar Nealon. I've been a pet sitter for 18 and a half years, and I want to Thank Brandon for being here. Brandon's phenomenal. Yeah. If anyone <laughs> needs help with dogs, he is the guy. He is the guy. He's been a lifesaver with people I know. Do you have a question, I know. Larsa? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Pasadena has money to enforce. So does San Francisco. L.A. doesn't. How do we enforce these laws? The laws are great, but following up is the problem in L.A. Um, I, I, just, I will say, uh, just to uh, give you uh, a little bit more information, uh, I just learned... About two months ago, L.A. County did approve um, some money over to the Animal Control uh, Department to enforce. Uh, Marsha might be able to say more a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to let her talk about that with you guys individually, <laughs> um, mostly because I have a few more hands up here, and I think we'll do one more question um, in the center. You had your hand up for a while. <laughs> Uh, my name is Laura. I'm actually a dog trainer. I have um, a few tips. One is just in addition to what you were saying about if you are actually being attacked, um, and you had a great comment, anything you can put in between you and that dog is great, even if it's, a, it's your male. Stick it in the dog's mouth. Okay. Another thing is if you're for sure going to be attacked by this dog, you want to give it something that you're, you can afford to lose, like your forearm. Don't give it your leg. If you give a dog your leg, it's going to take you down. It's going to get the rest of you. So that's a really thing, important thing to rem remember. If you're really afraid of being attacked, give, your dog, give the dog your forearm first. Another thing that I wanted to say <laughs> is I'm a huge fan of bully breeds, and I think that there are a lot of things that we all should be aware we can do to help these dogs. And one thing... Aside from what we've been talking about with spaying and neutering, one thing is we're talking about that look, the stare, mm -hmm. the kind of the glare. Mm -hmm. It exists. Learn about it. See what it means. Mm -hmm. See when you really do need to avoid it and when you need to take action. But also understand when a dog isn't giving that stare. So that way you can give, you can give a pit bull or a pit mix or an, an, like a power breed dog positive attention because the unfortunate part about this problem is we have all these dogs and because people are afraid of the way they look, they avoid them. So what happens, these dogs aren't getting socialization. These dogs aren't actually learning that these people are friends. They're actually, it's like, it's making the problem a vicious cycle because we're avoiding these dogs. So think about what you can do to make friends with a bully breed. Thank you for that. We're going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. Uh, thank you for having your hands up. It means that you guys are very interested. It means that you are interacting and you want to learn more. And ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I want to make sure that everybody hopefully came away with learning something or understanding something or just absolutely just having a great, fun discussion. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we'll be around a little bit to take some small individual comments. But um, thank you kindly.